in this service. So let's begin by having a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to take your word and, and learn something that might help us to uh, be drawn closer to you. And Lord, we pray that we'll learn from this example you give us tonight as we participate in this hour of, of this Lord's Supper as well. And I pray that our hearts will be filled with gratitude and appreciation for all that you've done in our individual lives and maybe things that uh, you've done for someone else uh, that possibly you haven't done in ours at this point, but maybe in the future. So, Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would tonight, take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Most of us uh, have probably read this chapter on numerous occasions, and uh, probably uh, some of you have not read it unless it's been read uh, at a service such as this uh, we call the Lord's Supper. In verse number 20, I'm going to start back, if you would, tonight. We usually don't read the scripture, but I want to uh, uh, start with uh, verse number 17. And then I'm going to jump back to chapter 16 in just a few seconds and give a few verses out there. It says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For the first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now let me just stop right there. Paul was dealing with a church here that really were, I'll just say, carnal. Their lives are not what they ought to be, though some of them were trying to be. And uh, Paul had to deal with them in regards to some areas that we're not going to get into tonight, but sin had crept into the church of Corinth. And uh, they had become uh, cold and indifferent in regards to the things of the Lord. In verse number uh, 18, it says there was a specific problem. And that was there were divisions among them. I believe the Lord was trying to draw people closer to one another and closer to himself in this single chapter. And if you were to go back to verse number 1... He says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And as followers of Christ, one of the principles that we want to uh, really dwell on tonight is the principle of unity. And one of the things he gave that would deal with this area is what we call the Lord's Supper. Coming together, dealing with sin, and we find that in chapter 11, and we're going to get to that in just a few seconds. But God wants us to deal with things in our life that will draw us closer, number one, to him, and then uh, also to um, uh, one another. Look at verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Uh, a second problem was there were false teaching. Now, one of the false teachings, if you listen very carefully, was this. Some of them thought that the body and blood of the, uh, the, the bread and the wine literally became the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus. No, the elements were simply reminders. They were symbolic in nature. They do not become the literal body uh, of the Lord or the blood of Jesus Christ when we partake of them. This was a heresy that was being taught. And so we need, we need to uh, deal with that. Look at verse 20. When you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one that taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Now, here's the third problem they were having. They were coming together feasting, and what had happened, uh, some had and some did not have. And those who had didn't want to share with those that didn't have. And you'll find as we get into the latter part of the chapter uh, in our reading that that was so. Verse number 22, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. Now this was some of the problems that were going on at the church of Corinth. And Paul wanted to deal with that. 
Look at verse 23 that actually begins the principle that we're going to participate in this evening. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betray, betrayed, took bread. Now remember, they're not participating in the Lord's Supper at this particular juncture. They are being dealt with in regards to the problems that were in their lives. And they were to deal with them in a specific way before they were to come to the Lord's Supper. And he says, that the Lord Jesus, the same night when he took bread, uh, he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, if you would look up here, please. He's trying to get across to these Corinthian Christians. It wasn't about them. It was about the Lord. It's all about him. And so often when we come to a service like this, we think it's about us. No, it's about him. We need to become Christ-focused. See, that changes the whole picture, amen? When we get Jesus in view. Now, he continues on with the thought in verse 26. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now he comes to help them to understand what to do before they get into the principle of celebrating this service we call communion or the Lord's Supper. He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread... Excuse me, yes. Uh, go back to verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, because of all the previous verses we've read up to this particular point, he says, take note. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, or in other words, an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, here is the principle we want to get to why he gave us all the previous verses was to deal with these problems that were prominent at the church of Corinth and could be possibly in your life. We're to examine ourselves to make sure that our hearts are not right. Now, none of us are perfect. None of us are. But aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin? That's why he brings us to this particular part of examination. That we deal with things in our life that we're to go ahead and partake of the Lord's Supper. He says, don't hold back. He says, just deal with those things. Don't be flippant in the area of dealing with them. Mean business with God. After all, he sees the heart, doesn't he? And we're not to judge one another. We're to let God judge us. Now he proceeds with verse 29. He says, now, here's a problem. If you do partake of the Lord's Supper in a flippant way, a uh, nonchalant way, not discerning the Lord's body. He says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, and eateth and drinketh, the word j damnation there means judgment. Now God judges when we are not willing to deal with sin. Now how does he do it? All right, let's read the next verse. He says, for this cause, many are weak, okay? One of the first things can happen to you, you can have a weakness in your life. Now, whether it be physically, whether it be emotionally, whether it be, you know, mentally, so forth and so on. He says, that can happen. Secondly, and sickly, all right? Now, just because that you get sick does not mean that, that this the sickness it can be a result of not judging yourself rightly as far as dealing with sin. Then the third thing the Bible says here, if you don't judge yourself rightfully and deal with it, and let God deal with the situation, 
He said there could be death. Paul not only dealt with this matter, but John dealt with it in his epistle, the first epistle of John, chapter 5. He says, there's a sin unto death, not that I say that you pray for it. We can die an early death because of not dealing with sin. Then he proceeds talking to these people of Corinth as well as you and I. He says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Now, Paul dealt with that back in, a, uh, in the book of Hebrews when he says, For whom the Lord loveth, what's he do, folks? Chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. God will chasten you. Then he says, if you've been without chastisement, if you're sinning and you can get away with it, you think you're getting away with it anyway. If you be without chastisement, then he says, look, you're not even my son. You're not even one of my children. You got religion, but you don't have Christ. <coughs> then he proceeds, chasing the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Now jump back to chapter 11, if you would, please. Look down at verse number 16. He says, the Lord's table demands something very important in our life, and that is Separation. The Bible says, Come out from among the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. God says, as Christians, we are to be identified as a separated people. That does not mean seclusion. Uh, we just, you know, we just, we're, we're to ourselves and, you know, it's just us and nobody else. No. Hey, we're only sinners saved by grace, folks. And so he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? The word communion there means fellowship. Communion, the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And that bread was from heaven. Speaking of Christ. There's some things back in chapter 11 I want to give you very briefly before we have the Lord's Supper. Often we find Jesus giving thanks in the Bible. And if you look down at verse number 24 of the 11th chapter there of 1 Corinthians, it says that when he had given, say it with me, thanks. I don't know if it was last week or all over the weekend, begin to think about tonight and really sharing what God would want me to give to you. Since it was a time when we were going to come together for the Lord's Supper, I thought I would just you know, go ahead with my teaching in the book of Psalms, but the Holy Spirit says, no, here's what I want you to teach. As my mind went across this verse 24 here, those four words... He had given thanks, just jumped out at me. And I said, well, what do you want me to do with those four words? What, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to say to your people here tonight? And I began to think, Jesus, the Son of God, gave thanks. And if Jesus gave thanks to the Father, how much more should you and I do that? And as I began to think out a little bit more, I thought about verses in the Bible where not only this location of uh, uh, one of the, uh, well, I say one of the most precious events that took place in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ when he got together with these people to teach them about the principle of remembering him and giving thanks. I want you to take your Bible very quickly, keep your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and turn back to the book of Matthew chapter 11. I want you to look at verse 25 
This is one location where Jesus gave thanks to the Father. Chapter 11, Matthew, and look at verse 25. It says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. You see, there's things that God makes known unto you and me that he didn't make known to the world. You see, the Bible says, Paul in another chapter said, and it kind of slips in my mind where the scripture is, and this, this just came to me, uh, that the Bible says, The natural mind receiveth not the things of God, neither can they understand the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. In other words, sometimes... And don't, don't, don't uh, take offense if unsaved people don't understand the Bible. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And you remember John said, there in John chapter 14, says when the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you in all truth. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You and I can understand scripture because we have a teacher that lives within us called the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was thanking the Father here. Look over at John. You're in Matthew. Look at John chapter number 11. Look at verse 41. Here's where we have the raising of Lazarus from the dead. There's a lot of things I could say here about this, but just giving you scripture that have to do with Jesus giving thank, thanks. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Jesus, the Son of God, thanked his Father for answering prayer. You see, the Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is our mediator. And we need to thank God for his Son being that one that hears our prayers and carries them to the Father. Look at the last scripture in Luke chapter number 10, verse 21. Luke 10. Look down to verse number 21 again when Jesus gave thanks. Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. You realize when you give thanks to God, that's good in his sight. And I thought about that. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 real quickly. Now Jesus comes to one of the most picturesque events that would show his total submission to the Father. And he teaches that total submission to his disciples. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 he gave thanks for what he was going to do and why he came into this world say, what was that? Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now how, we, how was he going to do that? He had given it before this event that he was teaching his disciples and then Paul records it. He gave thanks for what the body that God gave him in regards to the opportunity that he was going to be able to do something for you and me. 
Look there at verse 24, chapter 11. Let's read it together first of all, and then let me point the thought out to you. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for who? For you. This do in remembrance of me. You see, Jesus was given a body. Thank God for the human body that God permitted him to take on in order to communicate with you and me and also to die upon that cross, folks, because he could not die without a human body because he's God. Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. Now that's difficult for the world to understand. But this Bible tells us so. And he became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, Hebrews 10.5 says this, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wast not but a body, hast thou prepared me. See, he was able to carry out the will of the Father by the body that was given to him that was going to be sacrificed for you and me. He was thankful to the Father, and he was thankful that he could do this. And Paul, further on in his writings in the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 5, down through verse 8, you're very familiar with it. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He had the mind of God, because he was God, though he was 100% man. And Paul said, he took on him the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He had to have a body in order to die for you and me. And he gave thanks for that body. Secondly, he gave thanks for what his body symbolized. What was that? Once again, humanity. That he would take on all the, what should I say, the heartaches, the pains of physical, uh, uh, a physical body could ever take on, so he could become our high priest. He was, the Bible says he was, uh, you know, he was appointed under that. He went through all the afflictions so he could be able to sympathize with our problems that we go through. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, he is able to succor them that are tempted. In other words, able to help them, deliver them from the temptation. So, his humanity. He subjected himself to be a human being so the jaws of death could be clamped down on him and he could die for your sin and my sin. And he thanked the Father for that. Because folks, after all, that's why he came into this world. See? He didn't come to just live. He came to die. Now I know we're coming right around to Christmas time here and we celebrate his birth whenever it was. We, that's, we, that's when we celebrate it. And we ought to celebrate it. But the Bible tells us he was born to die. That's the reason he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. They didn't wrap anybody in swaddling clothes unless they were dead. Or going to they, they, they were dead. Thirdly, he gave thanks for what his blood symbolized. Blood spoke of one thing. Life. The life of the flesh is in the what, folks? In the blood. He was going to shed his blood so you and I could have life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sin. Sin brings forth what? Yeah. It brings forth death. Jesus came in John chapter 10 to give us life. Say it with me. And give it to us more abundantly. See. So, he gave thanks for what his blood symbolized. 
John chapter 10, verse 18, very quickly. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down my, of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Wait a minute, let me give you a fourth thing very quickly. He gave thanks for what his death would accomplish. You see, his death was not in vain, folks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, I know it goes on to say, too, and he was buried and he rose again the third day. Hallelujah. Then number five, in verse number 34, he gave thanks for that future coming and event of participation that once again we'll have the Lord's Supper with him. Look at verse number 34. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. We're going to have a great supper one of these days, amen? And we're going to have it with the Lord. Not that he isn't here tonight. Because he said, we're two or three are gathered in my midst. There am I. Oh, gathered together, there I am in the midst. I was thinking of a verse as I close this part of our service. And Luke twenty two sixteen 16 says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until I be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. But he says, I've given you an example. I've given you my body and my blood pictured in the bread and the wine to represent what I'm going to do for you and what I've done for you. And I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Now tonight, before we come to the Lord's Supper, I want us to take just a minute or so and I want you to bow your heads. And I want to give you this opportunity to, number one, if you're here and you've never been saved, your Savior. You see, that is important because that's what the Lord's Supper is all about, is his death for you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you just show the Lord's death. How long? Till he comes. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will come tonight. That'd be all right with me. But while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I wonder, is there anybody here say, Preacher, I need to be saved. I need to let Jesus come into my life. Is there anybody like that with our heads bowed and eyes closed? You just raise your hand and say, I need to be saved and I want to let Jesus come into my heart tonight. Anybody at all? Maybe those who are watching by means of the internet, maybe you need to be saved. Christ died for you. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe he died for you. You believe you're a sinner. You admit to him you're a sinner and ask him to save you and he will. Maybe as a Christian tonight you've come and you've not examined yourself. Why don't you do that right now? And anything that's not right in your life, why don't you ask him to cleanse you and confess that sin? Number one, the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why don't you do that right now? And we'll just take a few seconds here and let you do that before we have the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we've read here and looked at in the word. And we thank you for it. And I pray that now as we participate in this special service, I pray that our hearts will be drawn closer to you and we will remember you. 
give you thanks for giving your life. And so bless as we participate in this time together. We've gathered for this reason. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ed.